So thank you for letting me uh, speak to you tonight. Uh, those were lovely remarks from Jay. I, I like them a lot. I, I want to start by apologizing for my voice. It's actually a whole lot better than it was midday, and we'll see whether or not it lasts the next uh, 20 minutes or so. I'd like to start by recognizing we're meeting on the Haldeman Track, traditional territory of the neutral Ashnabin Haudenosaunee peoples. Territory is covered by the Upper Canada and Haldeman Treaties. I, I know not everybody uh, sees that as more than just sort of ritual, but I think it's important, uh, and for the Law Society it's important, uh, that we recognize that reconciliation with the indigenous people that we share land with really does matter. We have a long history which is not a great history in many respects, and the question is how do we get through that and change the relationship between all of us. So I want to say that in a way which is respectful and not rote. So I also want to say that it's a real pleasure to be at my first full of plenary as treasurer of the Law Society. Uh, hearing myself described as treasurer of Mercer sounds weird. <laughs> uh, I think of myself as Malcolm. Uh, but I'm, I think it's kind of cool that Jay doesn't exactly think that. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow you're going to hear from Diana Miles, and you all know Diana. Uh, one of the jewels in the crown of the Law Society is Diana. As CEO, she is spectacular, and we're really proud of her and well served by her. She's going to talk uh, in, uh, about some of the issues, uh, some of the plans about the Law Society's uh, next while. And uh, I'm not going to steal any of her thunder. Uh, I'm going to talk about something else. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is technology, and that's something which is in the, the, uh, the ether, if I can use a phrase which makes no sense when you talk about technology. <laughs> Before I do that, though, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Joe Groya's speech today. And uh, Joe joined the Law Society when uh, I had been four years as a bencher. Joe has made great contributions to the Law Society. He is intelligent, thoughtful, dedicated. Uh, he's a real pleasure to work with. And I enjoyed particularly uh, being described as part of the appeal panel, which was utterly unreasonable in his remarks today. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm told uh, by others who are wiser about these things that I have no right of reply, and so I shall move on. <laughs> so let's talk a bit about technology. The fact that there are advances in technology is not a surprise to anybody here, uh, but I think what's really interesting is how little seems to move in the short term and how much seems to move in the long term. So I graduated from engineering in 1977. I worked as a systems engineer for a couple of years after that. Showing my credentials as a visionary, I went into law because I saw no future in computers. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> when I arrived in, in legal practice, uh, the cool new technology was a memory typewriter where you could collect, correct one line. The personal computer, in 1984, as a young associate at McCarthy's, I had the first personal computer in the firm in AT. Uh, the fax machine came soon after that, and the idea of sending text from one place to another place was extraordinary. Uh, local area networks, word processing machines, wide area networks, the internet, servers were the story of the 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s. When I started at the University of Waterloo, this is a great place for me to give uh, one of my first set of comments as a treasurer, because I spent a lot of time at the University of Waterloo as a systems design engineer. When I started in 1972, the cool new thing was a four-function calculator. It could add, it could subtract, it could multiply, it could divide. It cost $500. <laughs> the engineering faculty was very concerned that we would lose our ability to do arithmetic as engineers. <laughs> and so it was banned from the examination rooms. <laughs> So we lose track of the progress of technology, but to try to put it in some sort of broad context, there are a couple of broad trends in the last 40 years. The first is what's called Moore's Law, and Moore's Law says, and it's a bit of a technical description, that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles about every two years. 
there'll be a test on this afterwards. <laughs> what that really means, taken out of the, the chip context, is that the power of computers has grown exponentially since uh, they first uh, were adopted in a real way in the late 1960s. In about 65, my grandfather took me to uh, Carleton University where he was uh, the chancellor, took me to the engineering department and showed me a computer. It was in a room much like this. Uh, it probably could do as much as my calculator could about five years later. What's changed since then is truly extraordinary. The power of that very big, very expensive device has gone up exponentially over four or five decades. And exponential growth over five decades is an amazing thing. We don't really understand the power of that. My $500 iPad is now more powerful than the half million dollar mini computer that I programmed from 1977 to 1979. The second thought after power of computing is interconnection. In the early and mid 1980s, we had a really complicated network. You took a five and a quarter diskette, or if you were really fancy, a three and a half inch diskette, and you walked it from one person to another. That was the network. If anybody thinks that's loopy, that's real. The idea of being able to move data in the mid-1980s in that way was extraordinary. So by the late 1980s, only five years later, uh, where I was, uh, was McCarthy's, and we had local area networks for the first time. By the late 1980s, we were connected together. We all had PCs. I told you I had the only one in 1984. By the late 1980s, we all had PCs. They were connected to a data general mini computer by a local area network. A couple of years, three years later, there was a wide area network that connected our offices. And then the extraordinary thing happened. By 93, 94, if I remember correctly, the internet arrived in a serious way. It had been around for a while as part of military intelligence, but it took off in a serious way. I remember sitting at a cottage in Maine going into a text version of the internet, no graphics yet, and finding the University of Hong Kong email service and sending an email to an expert that I had been dealing with in a personal injury matter. The idea that you could on your computer talk to Hong Kong was just wild and that was text-based. Add graphical form, and we're now only 20 years ago. So from my calculator to the first PC to the internet, one decade, second decade, third decade. Now we've had bubbles and crashes. Things haven't been in a straight line. If you think to the dot-com crash of 2001, you'll recognize that not everything goes in a straight line. There'll be times of hype There'll be times of skepticism, but if you take the long view, not the short view, the progress is truly extraordinary. Now, I think there's a third thing that's worth talking about as well as computing power and the ability of interconnection. But I'll pause for a moment. Think of the server farms and think of the interconnection for Google. You know, you don't see it, you don't feel it, but the ability to go on your machine, your tablet, your device, and to put something into Google and to have a real-time sense, imagine the speed of the network, imagine the speed of the computer, and it now seems like it's nothing. Now, I want to talk about a third trend, which isn't a 40-year or 50-year trend, uh, but it's a more recent trend. Before massive computing power and highly sophisticated networks, we didn't keep a lot of records. And that's really easy to understand because they were paper. That's why fax machines were so cool. And you had to put them in filing cabinets. And there was a limit to the number of filing cabinets you could have, and you couldn't find shit anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you think about the early 1980s, uh, you'd, you'd send your files off-site, and if somebody wanted them, you couldn't find them. And if you could find them, you couldn't find the stuff you wanted in them. And so we didn't keep a lot of records. If you look at Mr. Robinette's files, uh, I did a little bit of work f for Mr. Robinette when I started at McCarthy's. His files were just tiny. You know, they really were not significant. But with the massive computer that we have, computing power we have in networking, we've created vast amounts of information. 
coping with this volume of data is the stuff of electronic discovery and automated due diligence. It's interesting that the explosion of emails, the explosion of electronic documents caused we lawyers not to be able to cope with all of that. We used to pay young lawyers to work through all of this stuff 15 years ago. Really expensive, really slow, really awful jobs because we didn't have a way of dealing with the explosion. What we have more recently is a way of dealing with the explosion. The explosion is big data. So combine big data, powerful computing, and ubiquitous networks, and what you get is computers that win at chess, and more significantly win at Go, which is more complicated. And both of those are strategy games. You can make some sense of the logic. Then imagine a computer winning at Jeopardy. You know, it's only about seven or eight years ago uh, that Big Blue uh, won at Jeopardy, that Watson, sorry, Watson, Big Blue is chess. Watson won at Jeopardy. How do you program a computer to understand the question which is weird and give an answer which is weird and be able to beat human beings most of the time? Watson was able to do that. We also have computerized dictation. People think drag and dictate is a small deal. Drag and dictate is not a small deal. Taking what people say and converting that to words is complicated stuff. Google Translate is similarly complicated stuff. Taking text from Japanese and turning it into English without actually having intelligence, looking word by word is really interesting. Predictive coding, the ability to discern in millions of documents which ones are relevant and which ones are privileged without actually looking at each of the documents to do it cheaper and more accurately than human beings can do is extraordinary. Due diligence now where we're dealing with massive amounts of data, computers coding machine learning are going through these masses of documents and being able to sort out in major corporate transactions what is relevant and what is not relevant. Similarly, the creation, the automated creation of contracts. Blue Jay, uh, which you know comes out of Watson, out of the University of Toronto, similarly provides artificial intelligence-based tax case outcome. You give it a fact pattern, it's able to predict, it says within a certain percentage, what your odds are of achieving that result in trial. So all I want to do at the end of this part of what I'm saying is to describe to you the extraordinary, and I mean extraordinary, advances in the last 40 years. And if you think of the last five years, you don't notice it. If you la think about the last 10, it starts to seem interesting. If you think about my time as a lawyer, which is now 35 years, it's just wild. So I'm not saying, because obviously the punchline is what does this mean for lawyers, that lawyers haven't taken up technology. If you imagine the law firm in 1979 when I started at law school, you know, you had people who had ordinary typewriters and they were changing, they were negotiating contracts and their assistants were using whiteout or pieces of paper that were uh, covering over the previous version. It's hard to imagine legal practice without tools like Microsoft Word does anybody think Microsoft Word is a novel, important thing? It really is. Think about conveyancer in real estate practice. Think about Clio in, in the management of firms. Think about PC law in law firm accounting. We, are, we have a significant adoption now of technology into legal practice. This is both important and almost now dull. This technology makes existing legal practice better. Now, look at it, technology, though, in terms of what gets provided to clients as opposed to how lawyers do their work better. Most of the impact so far has been in, been in the big client world, not in the small client world. And that's no surprise. The big client world tends to have more problems of big data. It tends to have more problems where throwing resources at a huge problem it justifies the investment of substantial resources, substantial computing resources. Big clients 
in all ways, including in legal technology, legal services, are using technology differently. But think a bit about individuals. And I'm not saying, I want to say right now, I'm not saying the world has changed utterly for the service of individuals. What I'm really trying to say in this part of the discussion is imagine the next 10 years, the next 15 years, the next 20 years, if I've described fairly the last 10, 15, 20, 40. So individuals in their ordinary lives are becoming more aware of and better users of technology. Think of robo-advisors for financial transactions. You know, you would previously have gone to a mutual fund and paid 2.5% for what looks like advice. Now you're going to spend a fraction of that with robo-advising, which probably isn't all that different, depending on what advisor you've got. Think about chat box for customer service. If you go to Rogers or Bell and you actually talk to the thing on the side and you think it's a person, you're confused. <laughs> <laughs> Have you met Alexa? Have you met Siri? You know, the fact that people in this room will know who Alexa is and know who Siri is and have conversations with them. You know, I had a ridiculous uh, time with my daughter on the weekend as she asked uh, Siri ridiculous questions. It was just a hoot. The favorite question was, what do you think of Alexa? <laughs> <laughs> But let's turn to more practical things. There was a company that introduced a legal service called This Too. And some of you will know of it. It was started by an Ottawa lawyer. It's now defunct. This Too was aimed at providing spouses going through uncontested divorces with direct assistance. Users would input basic information like income, asset, number of kids, and the app would perform artificial intelligence-based case law searches to predict what a court would do. Based on the suggestions, this too would auto-fill the required forms, prompt users to gather other relevant documents, and then leave it to the parties to sort out what they wanted to do. The app at the end of that recommended they see a lawyer if they wanted more assistance. The service had thousands of users. In 2016, like two years ago, this too claimed to have been used in approximately 10% of all divorces in Ontario. And it only got up and running the year before. I'll give you another example called Do Not Pay. You may know this one. Do Not Pay is an automated chatbot lawyer developed again in 2016. We're in interesting times. By a 19-year-old British university student. Its purpose is to fight tr parking tickets. Started off as a simple tool to challenge tickets in London and New York. Totally free if you don't really understand it. What it does is actually sell services through information it gathers from you. You visit its web page, there's a chat interface, you get asked questions, a legal challenge is then generated that you send off within the jurisdiction. So to remind you, uh, this was written by a student in 2016. By 2017, July, Do Not Pay was available for use in England and eight American cities and it claimed to have 375,000 parking tickets appealed, a success rate of over 60%. And now it's expanded to flight refunds as well. My flight doesn't take off in time. I want to be able to make a claim. Is there anybody in here who's prepared to uh, assist a client in making a claim for a, a late flight? Does anybody think economically that makes sense? Anybody in here does parking tickets uh, in the way uh, that's described? So. I also want to be clear that I think there's a bunch of hype in all of this. I don't think the, the apocalypse is coming. For those of you who uh, read about artificial intelligence, I don't think we're on the eve of the singularity. What I do think is that there are interesting things happening. What's interesting is we can look at where we are and we can reflect forward a bit and we can see that things are likely to change. But we're at a cool point. We may actually have time to reflect on that change before it erupts on us, the uberization moment for lawyers. So let me ask you a few rhetorical questions. Actually, they're not rhetorical. Some of them, actually, quite, the answers are really hard. Uh, but the first one is rhetorical. So do you think this technology thing is nearly done? <laughs> do you think that we won't see much technological change in the next decade, keeping in mind the history I've given you? Is there anybody in the room who wants to debate that sign? 
So if you think it's not yet done, there are a few questions that a law society or a profession need to ask themselves. And here, genuinely, they're not rhetorical. I don't know what the right answers are. Not even sure if they're the right questions. So the first one is, should the law society try to stop technological delivery of legal services? Should we declare that legal service delivery by technology direct to consumer is unauthorized practice of law? Might work for a while. History suggests that would be tricky. Think about Blockbuster, think about Uber, and for the old timers, video kill killed the radio star. <laughs> Stopping internet delivery of technological services located outside of Canada might be a bit tricky, too. We're starting to see <coughs> legal services come in from other jurisdictions. For example, do not pay the student who created the, the chatbot. He's in England. He's delivering services in England. He's delivering services in the US. What if he simply delivered remotely the ability to challenge tickets in the city of Toronto or the city of Waterloo. What would the law society do about that as a practical matter? I personally think that this approach, hand up, please stop, is a bit like King Canute saying to the tide that the tide cannot come in. And leaving aside the practicalities, I've been talking about practicalities up to now, the law society is a regulator has a duty to facilitate access to justice, access to legal services. If we lived in a world where there were no unmet legal needs, if we lived in a world where all legal needs were fully served by existing providers, this would be a really uninteresting discussion. Where there are unserved or underserved needs, it's much harder to justify simply saying stop. And as well, and I'm one of these, if you care about self-regulation of a profession, if you believe that it's worthwhile, even if the regulator pisses you off from time to time, and I'm confident we do, that being part of a learned profession that is regulated by an elected group from the profession is worthwhile, it seems to me that just saying stop is likely to put real stresses on, on a self-regulating profession. So, I'm not inclined to think the first question has a, a no answer, that, or a yes answer. I'm not inclined to think we can prohibit what we think is coming. You may have a different view. I, I don't uh, say you shouldn't. The other answer, or the other question, is should we just pretend that it's not happening? Um, that sounds really stupid. Uh, I'm actually not persuaded that it is stupid. But there are a few problems with just ignoring it. I wouldn't hope that it goes away, but just ignoring it uh, may not be so terrible. But if we say it isn't our problem, is it not our problem if people get lousy services from these other ways of providing service? Is it not our problem if people get injured because of lousy service and have no recourse? Is it not our problem if confidentiality is not maintained and candor is not ensured? Is it not our problem if the administration of justice is corrupted through these technological services? Do not pay might encourage people to lie. It may make up stories which are fictional frauds on the administration of justice to beat a traffic system. Do we care? The other side of it is the law society, you may not know this, but this may be outside of our skill set. You know, the current expertise that we have as a law society is around the education, the training, and the conduct of professional human beings. Our long history is self-regulation of the legal profession, and now the paralegal profession. There are fundamental questions that are challenging if you apply them to computerized, technological-based service as opposed to professional people. For example, if we decide that artificial intelligence is providing legal services, does it meet the standard of a competent lawyer? And what the hell does that mean in that context? <laughs> Would it be by proving a level of accuracy in the output? What about less tangible stuff? Effective client communication from a bot? You know, does Rule 3.1 work in the context? 
what do we expect in terms of the competence requirement from the rules of professional conduct? And what about the requirement in the rules a lawyer should clearly specify the facts, circumstances, and assumptions on which an opinion is based? Artificial intelligence cannot do that because it's not reasoning. It's taking statistical inferences from big data, throwing it into massive computing power, and generating predictions that are correlations that it hasn't a clue which correlations caused what to be true. If a client wants to understand the basis and the opinion is provided by artificial intelligence, how does the client know what that means? What about overconfident or unreasonable assurances from a bot? How about an AI tool saying that you have a 73% chance of success? What I've tried to say in this is there are reasons to be skeptical about our ability to regulate technology and there are reasons to be fearful for society if someone doesn't and maybe it's not us. So I've already mentioned, so what I want to do is talk about some principles and some realities. First reality is that there's no reason to think technological advance will sputter out. There is the prospect of an Uberization moment someday in the future. And I say this with emphasis, especially if lawyers do not evolve technologically. If those in the room, those in the profession, stay where they are, there is a real, there is a greater risk, maybe it's 10 years out, maybe it's 15 years out, that Uber arrives and you have an atrophied competitor on the other side. If we care about the profession, we should care about avoiding that Uberization moment, not by stopping Uber, but by preparing to defend by being innovative. Microsoft evolved from MS-DOS. I remember that. I'm confident most of you don't. <laughs> Microsoft DOS, disk operating system, to Windows to the cloud. Kodak virtually disappeared. Blockbuster virtually disappeared. Apple has evolved from PCs to devices to platforms that provide music, movies, and apps. Do we want to be Kodak? Do we want to be Blockbuster? Or do we want to be Apple as a profession? Second reality is we have a problem with access to justice and access to legal services. As I said, if we were doing this well, if we covered all the legal services that people need and provided them at a price that worked, this would be a really uninteresting discussion, but I think you'll acknowledge that's not so. So the real question of principle is how does a public interest regulator not facilitate new service delivery at least in areas where services are not now available? And to me, that's the essential question. Not what do we do where things are working, but rather what do we do where things aren't working? At the very least, technological tools may accept, equip consumers to make choices for themselves that are better than the choices they have to make by themselves alone. New tools may reduce barriers, may democratize access, may make law more user-friendly, transparent, and direct, and it may drive down costs. Interestingly now, if you look in the private sector, not much is happening in the direct-to-consumer side. I've learned through the Law Society stuff that you can be over-enthusiastic about the next bright, shiny thing, and there's a risk of this being the next bright, shiny thing. So I spent a couple of weeks in the summer trying to find in England, Australia, the United States, and Canada what consumer, direct-to-consumer existed now. I was astonished how little there was. But there are things being developed. Interestingly, not-for-profits are doing some of the best job. A Clio is not a bad example in Steps to Justice. But what's interesting about the not-for-profits or the profits, for-profits that are doing things is they're focused on users, they're focused on the user experience. They're not focused on the lawyer experience. I was interested to listen to the discussion uh, around uh, uh, provision of services uh, this afternoon. And it makes perfect sense that it be so, but you were all describing a lawyer perspective on the world. Uh, and that's perfectly sensible when you're asked to do things differently. 
What I think is interesting is the designers of technology are interested in the consumer side, the user side. So obviously the Law Society focus has to be on consumers. Our job is the public interest. We want, desperately want you to succeed because you do great work, but we can't be your defenders. It's critical that we consider opportunities, not just merely focus on risks or barriers. Our focus on the public interest has to include the ability to access legal services as well as ensuring, better ensuring, that legal services are effectively provided, well provided. That's where competence and conduct come in. A really interesting challenge if we take on the, the role of regulating technology, technological legal service delivery. I'm persuaded, personally, that somebody has to do that regulatory thing. I'm personally unpersuaded that the Law Society is the right place to do that, but I don't know that that's right. We've got a clear interest in actively thinking about this. We're very much in the early stages of thinking about it. We know that other legal regulators are no further ahead than we are. We don't know what the right answers are. I'm confident we don't know what the right questions are. We know some of them, we don't know all of them. But I am confident we need to be thinking hard about all of this because if we don't, five, ten years from now, we'll be forced into rapid change without having thought things through. So what are we doing as a law society? We hosted a workshop on emerging technology in May. We brought in ventures, we brought in technologists, we brought in academics. We wanted to kickstart what we're doing. We're really pleased and we got lots of feed feedback. In the summer, one of the first things that I did as treasurer was propose to convocation that we establish a task force on technology comprised of ventures who will report to convocation. It gives us an opportunity to think slowly. If you think about Daniel Kahneman and Tversky, thinking slowly is a good thing. Deep and focused consideration of technology and the role of law society as regulator. What I have asked the task force to do is to come back in the spring, not with answers, but rather with a discussion paper, a white paper that raises the issues for the law society and the professions to think about, to start the discussion, not to end the discussion. One of my frustrations as a treasurer is I have two years and I then have to leave. And the most I think I can do in this project, and the most I want to do in this project, is set up the discussion that other people will have. We're also going to want to talk about, think about, how to help lawyers and paralegals innovate better. It's not just about opening new doors, it's about arming you for war, and uh, I hope that you'll think about that. We're building on the connections that we've developed in the tech community, other experts. We're looking for perspectives to get this right. Convocation as a board needs to be better educated as well. We're holding a one-day retreat ne next week, I think it is, I'm losing track, uh, to spend a day with uh, the benchers and experts to just spend a day talking about this. I firmly believe that ventures don't spend enough time being thoughtful. They react to the debates and the issues of the moment. I believe we need annually to meet together to think about issues, and the issue we need to think about this year is technology. Challenging issues, they raise questions for the law society, but all justice system actors will need to grapple. If we can get the balance right, then our regulatory framework should be able to encourage innovation in the interests of the people of Ontario that protects the interests of the people of Ontario. I don't think we can rush to judgment, but I don't think we can stick our heads in the sand. So my message to you today is if it's perfectly understandable if you think about the next three or four years in your lives, but we all collectively need to think about the next five, 10, and 15. And I'm inviting you to do that with us. So thank you very much.